All right. So our first chapter is going to be chapter six, the flow of food preparation. So today we're going to go over um, what are ways to prevent cross-contamination and time temperature abuse? What are the correct ways to thaw food? What are the minimum internal temperatures for cooking food safely? And what are the correct ways to cool and reheat food to the correct temperatures and in the correct amount of time? So when preparing food, um, cross-contamination and time temperature abuse are the two main focuses that you want to try to, the two main things that you kind of want to try to avoid. So you can do that by making good food preparation choices, um, by making sure workstations, workstations, cutting boards, and equipment are clean and sanitized. Um, make sure you only remove as much food from a cooler as you need at one time. Um, returning your pet food to the cooler or proper storage after you're finished um, using it or cooking it. Um, and then when using additives, only use additives approved by your local regulatory authority, um, not using more than allowed by law, and not using additives to alter their appearance of food. So one of the examples given in the book was um, using cooking sprays to um, enhance like the shine of food. You don't want to do that. Um, and then there are a few other examples in the book as well. Um, you don't want to sell produ any produce that was treated with sulfites um, before it was received to the operation. And then you don't want to um, add sulfites to produce that will be eaten raw either. Um, food must be offered to customers in a way that does not mislead or misinform them. Um, so we just did talk about this, um, adding food additives or color additives, um, colored overwraps or different lighting to make the food look different. And then food must be presented as it was described. So if you are offering um, a certain menu item, it has to be that menu item and not another one. The yeah. book is example, um, if you are offering fried perch, you can't use a substituted fish for that perch. You just can't sell that item. Okay. So some corrective actions, um, if you don't follow the proper preparation practices um, and the food becomes unsafe, you want to um, throw it out. If it was handled by staff who have been restricted or excluded from the food operation, um, if the food has is known to be contaminated by hands or bodily fluids, um, or if it has exceeded the time temperature requirements. Mm -hmm. So if it is um, abused by those time temperature requirements, you are able to restore it to a safe condition. Um, mm -hmm. So hot food can be reheated. Um, mm -hmm to return food to a safe food condition. So this will kill any pathogens or bacteria that is grown in the food um, and turn it, take it back to that um, correct temperature that it's supposed to be at. So when thawing food, you wanna thaw food by the correct measures. Um, so you don't wanna thaw any food at room temperature. I know that's something we do a lot um, in our homes sometimes, but you really don't want to do that in a commercial kitchen or a restaurant business because it's just really not safe. Um, when the food reaches about 70 degrees, that's when it gets really um danger zone. That's that's the danger zone, right? So that's when it's more likely to um be in that time temperature abuse area and it's just not gonna be good anymore. Um for a certain amount of time after you leave it out for that long. So the ways to thaw food are to refrigerate it um, in a cooler, keeping its temperature at 41 degrees or lower. Um, submerging it under running water at 70 degrees or lower. And the flow of water must be strong enough to wash loose food bits into the drain as it's coming off of the frozen food. Mm -hmm. So you want to use a clean and sanitized food preparation sink for this. You don't want to use a hand-washing sink. I know we mentioned that in the last chapters. Um, so that's one of the things. 
and then not letting the temperature of the food go above 41 degrees Fahrenheit for longer than four hours. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to cold food or thawing food, 41 degrees is the controlled temperature that you want to have it at. And anything above that, you don't want to have it at that for over six hours. Microwaving, oh. um, thawing food in a microwave oven, only if it will be cooked immediately after thawing. And then cooking, you can also cook frozen food as part of the thawing process. Um, so putting frozen burgers on a grill is an example. You can do that to thaw the food and then cook it. Um, so thawing fish that has been in reduced oxygen packaging um, should be frozen until ready for use. So you want to thaw it under refrigeration or before or immediately after thawing it under running water, you want to remove it from the packaging. You don't want to thaw it in that packaging. So when you're prepping specific food, um, you want to make sure that there's some care taken so there's not any cross-contamination. So not touching fruits and vegetables to surfaces that have been touched with um, fish, uh, raw meat, raw poultry, washing your produce thoroughly under running water. So the water wants, you want the water to be a little bit warmer than the produce. Um, and you want to make sure that you're separating the leaves from any grains um, so you're able to get in between the leaves and in the folds of the vegetable. Mm -hmm. And then you can also use some certain chemicals to wash the fruits and vegetables, but they have to be approved by a regulatory authority. Mm -hmm. So when you're soaking or storing um, vegetables for prepping or for, yes, for prepping, um, you don't want to mix multiple items or different batches because that can create cross contamination. Um, if something is, if one of the items is contaminated, you can contaminate the entire batch instead of just, you know, prepping one item um, in the sink, cleaning and sanitizing the sink, and then prepping the next item. So it'll reduce the um, likelihood of cross contamination. So when storing fresh cut produce, you want to refrigerate and hold sliced melons, cut tomatoes, and cut leafy greens at 41 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. And if your operation serves high risk populations, don't use raw seed sprouts in your foods um, because that is one of those danger items. So we're gonna go over egg and egg mixtures really quickly. Um, so you typically don't want to use um, any eggs that aren't pasteurized. Um, pasteurized eggs are safer for high-risk populations and just everyday people. Um, so the pasteurized eggs are treated to where they're heated up enough to kill any bacteria inside the eggs, such as salmonella. Mm -hmm. And then it's not cooked um, thoroughly. So I did a little bit of research on the pasteurized eggs and I thought uh, that's why eggs in America are refrigerated because they're pasteurized. So you want to keep those at that temperature, um, the refrigerated temperature, or you um, want to make sure you're cooking them properly with the proper amount of heat. Mm -hmm. And then we want to move to ice quickly we can go over that um so when using ice in your operation you want to only make ice from water that's safe to drink and if you're using ice to cool food or um so cool food while it's out you don't want to use that in any drinks or um any other dishes so ice can sometimes be used in soups and things to cool them down um, after cooking them. So you wouldn't want to use it in that. You wouldn't want to put it in someone's drink. So after that ice is used to cool an item, the ice needs to be thrown out to prevent cross-contamination. So there's some special requirements um, for preparations for different foods. Um, so a variance is a document issued by a regulatory authority that allows a regulatory requirement to be waived or changed. So this 
goes with um, prepping certain foods um, for your business. So if you plan to um, package fresh juice on site, um, it has to have a warning label. Um, smoking food as a way to preserve it, but not enhancing the flavor. So if you're just smoking barbecue or something, that's fine. But if you're smoking a food to extend the shelf life of that food, then you need um, a variance for that. Um, using food additives or adding components such as vinegar to preserve or alter the food. So it doesn't need time and temperature control for safety. Curing food. Custom processing animals for, for, for personal use. So if you go hunting and you bring an item from outside of your food preparation area into that food preparation area and you're preparing it for yourself and you're going to take it back out, you'll need a variance for that. Packaging food using a re reduced oxygen packaging method. So that's like um, sous vide or um, vacuum sealed foods. Sprouting seeds or beans and offering live shellfish from a display tank. So that would be like um, the lobsters you see at Red Lobster in that um, display tank. They need a variance for that. So when cooking food, um, you wanna make sure that the food is at the correct internal temperature. Um, so the temperatures vary from different food, from food to food. So poultry, red meat, um, roast fish, they all have different internal internal temperatures. Um, so a way to check the temperature is you want to pick a ther thermometer with a probe that is the correct size for the food. Um, so if it's a very small fillet of meat or fish, you don't want to use a very large thermometer with a large probe. Um, check the temperature in the thickest part of the food and take at least two readings in different locations. So the thickest part is the part that takes the longest to heat up, obviously. So you want to um, check the temperature in that part in two parts, um, just in case, you know, you get an inaccurate reading in one part or one part just isn't cooked the whole way or it's cooked more than a different part. Um, sometimes if you're cooking on a grill, it might have different temperatures um, in different areas. So you just want to make sure that the meat is cooked the whole way throughout. So there are cooking requirements for, for specific types of foods. So poultry, including whole ground chicken, turkey, or duck, should be cooked at 165 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 seconds. Um, and then this includes stuffing made with fish, meat, or poultry, and then stuffed meat, seafood, poultry, or pasta. So ground meat, um, such as beef, pork, and other meat, um, injected meat like brine ham or uh, flavor injected roast, tenderized meat, mechanically tenderized meat, um, flightless birds with flat breastbone, breastbones. So that includes ostrich and emu, although they're not very um, popular. You still want to make sure we're doing that. Um, ground seafood, including chops or minced seafood, and shell eggs that will be held for service um, should be all cooked at 155 degrees Fahrenheit. So shell eggs that will be hot held for service that's something like um, a buffet. Like you go to a breakfast buffet and they have scrambled eggs. So that's what they're talking about there. Um, seafood, including fish, selfish, and crustaceans, steaks or chops of pork, beef, veal, and lamb, commercially raised game or shell eggs that will be served immediately will be need to be cooked at 145 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 seconds. And then roast of pork, beef, veal and lamb need to be held at 145 degrees Fahrenheit for four minutes. Um, and then there are a few different, uh, there's a chart with different times and temperatures that you can cook the those specific foods at. Um, and then when cooking fruits and vegetables, it will be hot held for service. So hot held, again, is that buffet style. Um, this includes fruits, vegetables, grains, like rice and pasta and legumes, um, beans, refried beans, like things like that um, will need to be held at, cooked at 135 degrees Fahrenheit. So whenever you are um, cooking food, 
a TCS food to the required minimum internal temperature, um, you will need to have a disclosure and a reminder. So the disclosure is what you usually see um, on a restaurant menu. And it'll say this item is served while undercooked or contains um, or may contain water raw or undercooked ingredients. And then the reminder is that that can increase your risk of foodborne illness. Um, so we want to make sure we're following all the rules um, set by the local regulatory authorities and federal. So when you're um, serving high-risk populations, you can't serve certain items. So you can't serve raw seed sprouts, um, raw or undercooked eggs or unpasteurized eggs, um, meat or seafood. So this is over easy eggs, raw oysters, um, and like rare hamburgers or medium rare hamburgers. Those are all very dangerous to people with, um, and that are high risk and then unpasteurized milk or juice. So you are able to cool and reheat food um, when it is not served immediately. So the temperature requirements for cooling food um, should be cooled from 135 degrees to 41 degrees within six hours. So the food needs to be cooled from 135 degrees to 70 degrees within two hours. And then following those two hours, you have four hours to cool it from the 70 degrees to 41 degrees. And then if the food hasn't cooled, you will have to reheat it and then try to cool it again within that time period. So some factors that affect cooling are the thickness of the food, um, the size of the food, and then the storage container that it's in. Um, and some methods for, for cooling food um, are ice water baths, um, a blast chiller, which is um, cold air hitting the food, an ice paddle. So an ice paddle just is a paddle filled with water that is frozen or filled with ice. You can put it and mix it in the food um, that will cool it. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, putting ice or cold water into the food as an ingredient, such as soups. Um, so then to store food for, for, for further cooling, you can put it in, um, you can store it uncovered for a period of time, um, as long as there's no way for any pathogens um, to get in that food. And you always want to store it um, with ready to eat food above food that hasn't been cooked yet. So to reheat food, um, you need to heat it to an internal temperature of 165 degrees Fahrenheit um, from two hours start to finish. All right. So we will do the case study, the chapter review case study. So Amanda had a busy day ahead of her at the company cafeteria. Looking in the freezer, she realized that she had forgotten to thaw the chicken breast she had planned to serve for lunch. Moving quickly, she placed the frozen chicken in a prep sink and turned on the hot water. While waiting for the chicken to thaw, she grabbed the fan, a pan of leftover clam chowder from the cooler and placed it in the steam table to heat up. When the lunch hour ended at 1.30 p.m., Amanda had a lot of cooked chicken breast left over. No problem, Amanda thought. We can use the leftover chicken to make chicken salad. Amanda left the still hot chicken breast in a pan on the prep table while she started putting other food away and cleaning up. At 9.45 p.m., when everything else was clean, Amanda put her hand over the pan of chicken breast and decided they were cool enough to be put away. She discovered the pan with plastic wrap. She covered the pan with plastic wrap and put it in the cooler. So what did Amanda do wrong? Um, She first, I thought on here, she didn't wash her hands either between two. She used the prep sink. And then she also... Use hot water mm -hmm. to thaw it out. And I believe the time, I'm not really sure about the, yeah, the time she left it out too long. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, so she shouldn't have left it out at room temperature. 
um she should have put it um she should have pulled it in one of those methods that we just used and then what should amanda have done differently um i wasn't sure about the cooling system the blast chiller i don't even know what the blast chiller was but it says that we should possibly use a blast chiller but what is a blast chiller so it's a cooling method um it's a tool that you can use to blast cool air over items to cool them mm -hmm. down quicker. So it's it's like a like a heating gun, just the opposite, a cooling gun, like blasting it. Um, like I ice. believe so. I haven't okay. seen one or mm -hmm. used one before. Okay. Um, I don't know of the other things. The microwave. Mm -hmm. I thought when you do use the food like that, you have to cook it immediately. She yes. could put it in the microwave. Yeah. So she um she should have thought it under um using running running water under seventy degrees or lower. Um and then she should have moved them to the cooler instead um of leaving them. Mm -hmm. on the table um and then she also should have reheated the clam chowder to 165 degrees oh um, yeah before moving it to the same table mm -hmm. okay so let's move on to chapter seven so chapter seven is the flow of food service so what we'll be covering in this chapter are what are the guidelines for holding hot and cold food when and how can food be held without temperature control? How can you prevent contamination when serving food and in self-serve areas? How can you prevent contamination and time temperature abuse when serving food off-site or through vending machines? Mm. So when holding food um, for service, it's at risk for time temperature abuse and cross-contamination. So some ways to hold food so those things won't happen are by using food covers and sneeze guards, um, holding uh, TCS food at the correct internal temperatures. So hot food at 135 degrees Fahrenheit and cold food at 41 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, using a thermometer to check the food's internal temperature. Checking food temperatures at least every four hours. So if it's not at the correct temperature, at that four hours, um, you want to throw it out, but you can check it out every two if every two hours if you want to have corrective action on that food. So either heating it up or recooling it. So hot holding equipment shouldn't be used to reheat food um, unless it's designed to do that. So like in the last example. Um, she put the clam chowder in a hot on a hot steamer. She should reheat the food before putting it on a hot steamer. It's not meant to do that. It's not meant to heat the food to the correct um, holding temperature. So you can hold food without temperature temperature control, um, and you can only do this when displaying food for a short period of time. So offsite catered events. Um, so we only want the food to be out at these temperatures for about four hours at max, and then when electricity is not available to power holding equipment. So you can hold cold food without temperature control for up to six hours. Um, if it's um, at 41 degrees or lower, we're removing it from refrigeration. Um, you want to label the food with the time you remove it from refrigeration and the time you must throw it out. Um, and it has to be six hours from the time you removed it from refrigeration. Mm -hmm. um, you want to make sure the food temperature doesn't exceed 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And you want to sell, serve, or throw out the food within six hours. And this is all for hot for cold foods. Mm -hmm. For hot foods, this is the food that you only want to um, hold without time temperature control for up to four hours. So the food should always be held at 135 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. It should be labeled um, and the discard on the label should be four hours from the time you remove the food from temperature control. 
So this includes transportation, setup, all those things, if you are doing an off-site catering event. Um, and then self-serve or throw out the food within that four hours. So when serving food, um, there is a big threat of contamination because so many hands are and people are around the food and touching the food, preparing it to go to the customer. So some guidelines that you can implement by your, for your kitchen staff are bare hand, no bare hand contact with food. Um, so making sure that they're using single hand gloves when um, handling ready to eat food or using spatula tongs, deli sheets, or any other utensils that will eliminate bare hand um, contamination on the food. Um, using clean and sanitized utensils. So um, using separate utensils for each item. And if consistently using the utensils for a long period of time, you wanna either make sure that you're changing out the utensils to use clean ones um, every four hours, or you wanna be cleaning and sanitizing that utensil that you're using every four hours. Um, when using serving utensils, you wanna store them in the food with the handle sticking out of the container. Um, a lot of people are gonna be touching the handle without gloves on. Um, if it's self-serve, if your staff is serving the food, we still don't want cross-contamination from anything else that they may have touched. So we wanna make sure that the handle is sticking out of um, the container that the food is in, or you can place them on a clean and sanitized food contact service um, instead of holding them in that container. So when using spoons or scoops for ice cream or mashed potatoes, you wanna make sure they're either under running water or you can store them in a container of water that is at least 135 degrees Fahrenheit. So you typically don't refill take-home food containers, but you can. Um, if they're designed to be reused, um, if they're provided to you, to the guests by you or your business, um, or if they're clean and sanitized correctly, um, And then they also must be um, cleaned with fresh uh, hot water under pressure um, or be refilled by staff in operation or by the guests. Um, navigating cross-contamination. So when your service staff is serving food, um, you wanna be sure it's a whole dishes by the bottom or the edge of the dish. Um, holding glasses by the middle or bottom or the stem and not touching the food contact areas of dishes or glassware. So you don't want to touch the middle of the plate. You don't want to touch the rim of the glass, um, the prongs on a fork, um, the cutting part on the knife or just like the spoon head itself. Um, you want to carry glasses in a rack on a tray to avoid touching the surfaces um, and not to stack glasses when carrying them. So typically you'll touch the outside of the glass with your hand and I then put another all. glass in there and that surface can get, you know, the bacteria or something on it. Mm -hmm. I see it all the time. Mm -hmm. So you want to hold flatware by the handle. Um, like I mentioned before, don't, uh, you don't want to hold flatware, flatware by food contact services and then store the flatware so servers can grasp handles and not the food contact services. So you wanna store the utensils with the utensils facing downwards. So the handles are upwards so they can grab the handle rather than grabbing um, the food contact surface. Mm -hmm. um, avoid bare hand contact with food that's ready to eat. So the example they gave here in the book is using um, tongs to touch a bagel rather than your bare hands. Um, and then using ice scoops or tongs to get ice um, you don't want to touch it with your hands. And then if you are going to use glass, the glass can potentially chip um, or just flat out break. I've seen glasses break in ice and then you can't use the ice anymore and you have to pour um, like red dye in there or grenadine to show that ice is no longer good for use um, mm. because those glass pieces are very dangerous. Um, 
So that all has to be thrown away and cleaned out. Um, and that can take a really long time. Mm. So when reserving food, you don't typically want to reserve food at all unless it is prepackaged food or condiments. So condiments like ketchup, mustard, um, A1 sauce, things like that that are in packages can be reserved to guests for them to use. Um, prepackaged items such as crackers, um, maybe some croutons, those can be reserved. Um, but you don't want to reserve food. Um, from the menu item. So that's food returned by the guest. Um, you don't want to give that to somebody else. Um, condiments that aren't in their original packaging, um, like mayonnaise, butter, uh, different things like that, um, uncovered condiments, salad dressing that's maybe in a ramekin or something. You don't want to reserve that to someone else um, or combine any leftover con condiments with fresh ones. Um, so you want to throw away all the open portions of con condiments or partially used portions of the condiments. Even condiments that have gone to a table to a customer or a table and they haven't used it, you still want to throw it out because there is a likelihood that a pathogen has gotten in that condiment before it's brought back to the kitchen. So you don't want to um reserve any bread or rolls, even like chips at um at a Mexican restaurant or um vegetables that may not have been eaten at maybe a wing restaurant, something like that. So that mm. all needs to be thrown out. Um and then garnishes. So fruit, pickles, things like that, that all needs to be thrown out as well. So self-service areas can also be contaminated very easily. So to prevent this, um, you should use sneeze guards to protect it or placing it in display, display cases or by packaging the food um, for easy access to customers. Um, labeling the food in the self-service areas um, with um, ladle handles or on ladle handles um, or having signs Keeping hot food hot at 135 degrees Fahrenheit and cold food cold at 41 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then not offering raw or ready to eat foods um, with self-service um, as a self-service item. So some raw foods can be like sushi or raw shellfish, um, such as oysters on the half show, um, or then ready to cook. Foods. So a lot of um, Mongolian places or um, even Korean barbecue sometimes will do that where you can cook it yourself or um, they'll cook it for you after you pick what you want to eat. Mm -hmm. So if the food will be cooked, then you can offer it raw. But if it won't be, then you cannot. Mm -hmm. um, not letting your guests refill dirty plates or using the dirty utensils at self-service areas. So a lot of times, like even restaurants like Golden Crow, we see this, who will finish their plate and then we'll go back up and put something on there. So mm -hmm. typically you will have staff that is monitoring monitoring that, um, asking guests to please, you know, put your plate in the, put your dirty plate in the bin and get a new one. Um, and that mm -hmm. uh, mitigates cross-contamination. Um, using the correct utensils for um, dispensing food, like tongs, ladles, deli sheets, things like that. So people aren't touching the food with their bare hands. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, ice to keep food or beverages cold should not be used as an ingredient. So for offsite service, um, you want to have um, different things that... Uh, Sorry, <laughs> you want to have different things that um, will decrease the risk that food will be exposed to contamination or time temperature abuse. So you want to pack food in insulated food containers. Um, they're designed so food can't mix, leak, or spill. Um, and then at the service site, you want to use um, appropriate containers or equipment to hold foods at the correct temperatures. So a lot of the times um, they will put containers in 
the the other container with hot water and then like the um the flames underneath it so that would keep the food warm or they'll put it over ice so it'll keep the food cold um labeling food with a use by date time and reheating and service instructions for staff on at the off-site location so like we said before if it's a cold food you can only you only want to leave it out for six hours if it's a hot food you only want to leave it out for four hours so making sure that the staff that is serving that food knows when those times are um, so you want to label that food so it's not served past that time. Um, clean the inside delivery vehicles regularly. Um, that's how pathogens get in food. Um, old food that may have spilled, dirt that may have gotten to the vehicle, um, droppings from animals, things like that. You want to make sure that the um, vehicle is clean, even sanitized. Um, and then checking internal food temperatures just to make their time and temperature controlled. Um, you want to make sure the service site has the correct utilities. So you want to make sure they have um, safe water for cooking, dishwashing, and hand washing, um, and having garbage containers stored away from food prep, food storage, and serving areas. And then I know we talked about this in the first couple chapters, but having the raw foods stored away from the ready-to-eat foods is important as well because the raw foods contain um, pathogens since they haven't been cooked already. So you don't want to mix those foods at all. So when handling um, food that has been prepared and packaged for vending machines, um, there are some things that could mitigate risk um, when using those vending machines um, for time te temperature abuse um, during transport, delivery, and service. Um, so you want to check the product shelf life daily. So they'll have an expiration or use by date. You want to make sure that you're checking all the products so someone doesn't get an expired product, potentially eat it and get sick. Um, so anything that is expired or is closer to use by date and you don't think it will be used, you want to throw that out. Um, so it needs to be sold within seven days of preparation. Mm -hmm. So keeping TCS food at the correct temperature. So it should be held at 41 degrees Fahrenheit or lower and at 135 Fahrenheit degrees Fahrenheit or higher. Typically you see um, vending machines with refrigeration more than um, with heat. So the food, the vending machine has to have controls that will not dispense um, the TCS food if the temperature is in a danger zone for a specified amount of time. Um, dispensing the TCS food in its original container and washing and wrapping fresh food, fruit with edible peels or um, wrapping before putting it in the machine. You don't want to put anything um, just in the machine just as it is, you want to have a container on the outside of the machine. Mm. So we're going to review the case study for chapter seven. Jill, a line cook on the morning shift at Memorial Hospital, was also filling in for the kitchen manager, who usually supervises lunch in the cafeteria. Jill was also responsible for making sure meals were trayed and put into food carts for transport to the patient's rooms. The staff also passed packed two dozen meals each day for a neighborhood group that delivered them to homebound early, early elderly, sorry, elderly people. Knowing the delivery driver would arrive soon to pick up the meals, Jill looked for insulated food containers to hold them. When she could not find any, she loaded the meals into cardboard boxes she found near the back door. The cafeteria was busy and the staff had many meals to tray and deliver. As the lunch period was ending, Jill breathed a sigh of relief. She moved down the cafeteria's serving line checking food temperatures. One of the casseroles was at 135, 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Jill checked the water level in the steam table and turned up the, th the thermostat. She then went to clean up the kitchen and finish her shift. What did Jill do wrong? Um, The temperature for the casserole it said it was at 130. Um, the casserole, that was the wrong temperature. It should have been checked, I believe, for her to know the real the temperature. It was a it was cold though. What it was a cold. Yes, it should have been. It should, it should have been, been one hundred thirty five degrees. Yeah, it should have been mm -hmm. one hundred thirty five degrees above. Okay, so it was one thirty. So we know the temperature, but she was traveling with it, so she could have been using some kind of. Um, I think it was on this page. 
11, the heating, some kind of heating device. You put it inside the packing, the heating packing to keep it um, warm or, or hot. Right. She could have done that. Yeah. Um, I don't know what else she did wrong as far as the first part. So she didn't, she didn't check the temperatures, um, the internal temperature of the food on the table, um, and she just turned up the um, steam table when she realized it was too cold. Um, okay. So and then the she steam. packed the deliveries in cardboard boxes instead of mm -hmm. making sure that they were ins in insulated containers. Okay, yeah. So the steamer is not to keep it. I mean, no, keep, the steamer is to keep it. It's not to heat it. You have to right. reheat it. And then once you reheat it, it just keeps it. The mm -hmm. steamer does. Okay, I'm getting it. Because I'm like, but the steamer is hot. Okay. You should be able to keep it, but it won't keep it to the temperature. Right. Because I had a question on like, why can't you use it? It's not that you can't. I get it. That was my okay. question mark. <laughs> Got you. So we have the answer for that one. And then what should Jill have done? Well, she should have reheated it um, so that it could come to the temperature. And, or, I'm not sure if she should have thought it out if she reheated. But if it stayed out too long, she would have to throw it out. Yeah, she would have to throw it out. So it's she it. um she should have like kept the delivery meals in a hot holding container instead of the cardboard boxes. Um and then since she didn't know how long the casserole and the other food was it at that temperature because she didn't um record the temperature every four hours, she should have just thrown it away. Mm. <laughs> wow. The food industry is a very um sensitive to profit <laughs> yes it's pretty particular so now we're going to move on to chapter eight food safety management systems so the study questions for this chapter are what are food safety management systems what is active managerial control and how can it be applied and what is hazard analysis control critical control point system so a food safety management system is a group of practices and procedures intended to prevent foodborne illness by actively controlling risks and hazards throughout the flow of food. So in the diagram below, um, it gives some examples of that. So having a personal hygiene program, a food safety training program, supplier selection and specification program. So that's um, acquiring a reputable supplier, um, quality control and assurance programs, Cleaning sanitation programs, standard operating procedures, facility design equipment maintenance programs, and pest control programs. Those are all ways um, that you can have a food safety management. Those are all um, food safety management systems that you can implement um, to prevent foodborne illnesses in your business. Mm. So the common risk factors for foodborne illness um, are purchasing food from unsafe sources, Failing to cook the food correctly, um, holding food at incorrect temperatures, using contaminated equipment, or practicing poor personal hygiene. Um, so as a manager, it's your responsibility to actively control these um, risks and other factors for foodborne illness um, by using active managerial control. Um, so you want to make sure this is proactive rather than reactive um, by planning for these risks rather than taking action whenever, you know, this risk has occurred. Because by that time, people have probably already gotten sick. Um, mm -hmm. People will need to shut the operation down. Mm. So when implementing an active ma managerial control in your operation, you want to identify the risk. So this is finding and um, documenting the potential foodborne illness risks in your operation, and then identifying the hazards that can be controlled or eliminated to prevent that risk. Um, monitoring, so making note of where employees must monitor food safety requirements within the operation. 
taking corrective action um, to correct improper procedures or behaviors, um, having management oversight, so verifying that all policies, procedures, and corrective actions are followed, and training, um, ensuring all employees are training to follow procedures and retain and retrain when necessary, um, so if people aren't following the correct um, hand washing procedures, um, they're leaving their aprons on when going to the restroom. They're not following procedures when it comes to reheating food or cooling food at the correct temperatures. You're going to want to retrain them because they just really might not know. Um, and reevaluation, periodically assessing assessing the system to make sure that it's working correctly and effectively. So there's some um, recommendations for controlling common risk factors for foodborne illness um, by the FDA, um, and they're known as public health health interventions. Um, so you want to have a demonstration of knowledge as a manager, knowing that you showing that you know what to do to keep the food safe, um, putting it place in procedures that um, make sure that staff are practicing personal hygiene, um, controlling hands as a vehicle of contamination. So in the first couple chapter, we talked a lot about how. Um, Hands are one of the main ways that pathogens get in food um, from people touching their hair, their body, their face, their mouth, um, using the restroom, not washing their hands, or touching um, raw items and used by um, uh, introducing pathogens to the food by cross-contamination. So you want to make sure that um, you're preventing bare uh, hand contact with ready-to-eat foods. Um, having time and temperature parameters for controlling pathogens. So making sure that the food doesn't spend a lot of time in that time temperature um, danger zone. And then having consumer advisories. So um, providing customers with notices if you serve raw or undercooked meats or seafoods. So HACCP is a hazard analysis critical control point. Um, so this identifies significant biological, chemical, or physical hazards um, at specific points within a product's flow, um, and then being able to prevent, eliminate, or reduce those hazards to safe levels after they're identified. So it must be based on a written plan um, specific to your facilities, menu, customers, equipment, processes, and operations. So every operation doesn't have the same customer base, you don't have the same equipment, um, you don't have the same menu items. So you want to make sure that your plan um, or your program is tailored to the needs of your food operation. Mm -hmm. So we will go over the case studies. It's a very short chapter. Only yeah, this is one pages. that I, I thought I did them all, but I must have misjudged. I actually did six, seven, I think I did, I mean, did the last one we did before and not realizing I was doing the last chapter from last week. Okay, so you did I five, did six, three and chapter. seven. Yeah, but okay. I did. So That's I'm okay. Like, well, this one's pretty short, so we got the information down. Um, yeah. And then you can still go back and look at the study questions and the yeah. answers. That's, um, what, that's what got me in trouble. I went back. <laughs> <laughs> so... Carolyn, a new manager for Bobo's Bistro, felt a lot of pressure from her district manager to do well. Carolyn thought she could save money by purchasing produce from her friend, who has a large garden in his yard. This would save a couple hundred dollars per month. She placed an order for a delivery the next day. Next, she walked around the restaurant to make sure everything was going to be ready for the dinner rush. She noticed the cook took the temperature of salmon as it came out of the oven. It read 125 degrees Fahrenheit. Carolyn then checked the soups that were in the hot holding wells. She took the temperature of the lobster bisque, which she did every two hours, and it read 105 degrees Fahrenheit. She asked the lead cook, Tom, to reheat the soup. Carolyn walked past Eddie, who was prepping ground beef for burgers. She noticed he did not have a hat on because the apron looked very dirty. She asked Eddie to put on a clean apron. Carolyn was finally finished making her rounds and started back to her office when she saw Eddie switch from prepping burgers to making Caesar salads. He was using the same cutting board and knife to prep the lettuce. She told Eddie to wash, rinse, and sanitize the cutting board and to toss any lettuce that he had already cut. She thought it would probably be best to conduct a quick training session on cross-contamination for all staff. What did Carolyn do correctly? 
Well, she did decide to, she walked around first though. She did, she went around and she checked on everything and she noticed some things, but the best thing she did was to walk around and she did get rid of the contaminated was what she thought would be contaminated. Mm -hmm. So that's what she did, uh, right. Um, she did check every two hours, that was a good thing. Instead of waiting to the four hours where she wouldn't be able to reheat anything, She's mm -hmm. losing time um, where she can make that corrective action before it gets to the six, four hours it is for the cold and for six hot. for the hot. Yeah. So those were the things that I identified she did well. Say so anything right. else? So um, she also asked the prep cook to put on a clean apron since his was mm -hmm. Yep, sanitized and rinse the cutting board too right so they did a lot so mm -hmm. what did carolyn do incorrectly um i think that the soup it was 125 she said she checked the soup in the whole thing it should be more that was incorrect the, the well her corrective action was right because she asked the chef to reheat the soup Oh, okay. So when she mm -hmm. found it, then she went back in and did. right. Um, I don't know what she did incorrectly. So she purchased from a friend instead of a <gasps> reputable supplier. Um, the the salmon wasn't at um the right temperature. Um, she should have asked them to cook it a little bit longer. And then she should have told the prep cook to put a hair restraint on as well, since he didn't have on a hat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, she bought it from somebody. Saving money. All right. So that wraps up our study session for today. Um, next week on Monday, before the um, training on Tuesday, we'll have um, our last study session which will be on chapter nine and 10, um, same time, same day, six to 7 mm -hmm. p.m. And then the training will be from 12 to five um, on Tuesday and Wednesday. Tuesday and Wednesday, that's the 23rd. Okay. I don't know why I thought it was Wednesday and Thursday, but okay. 22nd and 23rd? The 23rd and 24th. So that's Tuesday and Wednesday. That's Tuesday and Wednesday, yes. Okay, so we're going to be doing a study session there. I get it. I thought you was meaning. All right. So we're going to yes. do Monday So we're going to be doing together. our study session still on Monday, the 22nd, um, mm -hmm. to cover the last two chapters in the book. And then on Tuesday and Wednesday, that will be the training and certification. Okay. From 12 to 5. Right. Yes. And so something else I noticed was there... The workshops for the farmer's market still on Thursday? So the last couple have been changed. Um, the last one was on a Tuesday, and then this upcoming one is tomorrow on Tuesday as well. Um, okay. It is okay. at the Jefferson County Extension Office, but mm -hmm. there's also a link for Zoom. Right. Um, whatever for the social one-on-one, it was a social 